Good morning, and welcome to worship with us at Truckstop United Methodist Church. We are thrilled to have lots of faces here with us in the sanctuary on Mother's Day, and hopefully many folks joining us on Facebook and YouTube later on today. Just a couple quick announcements. Uh, a huge thank you to Barry, the trustees, everybody who made the chicken barbecue a success. We had two sellouts, if I heard right. Uh, both Friday and Saturday night were complete sellouts, and all of those proceeds are going to go to the window project. So thank you all. If you cooked, if you cleaned, if you served, if you ate chicken, we appreciate you for everything that you did. Coming up tomorrow evening at 6.30, I want to invite as many of you as can to come to a children and family ministries meeting. It's going to be tomorrow night at 6.30 in Zoom. And really there are two items on the agenda. Um, Vacation Bible School, we've got the date set for that. We're going to talk about how that program is going to work. My guess is we're going to need a whole lot more volunteers than we ever did before because we're going to try and stay in smaller groups and keep everybody as, as safe and contained as we can. And then the second thing you're going to hear about then, and you're also going to hear about it a little bit during worship, is a mission opportunity this July, a couple weeks before Vacation Bible School, July 11th through the 16th. Uh, UM Army is a local mission project. It's a chance for us to go out in the community down the mountaintop and do some service projects. The best part is you get to sleep in your own bed, shower at your own house, you don't have to sleep on the floor. Um, so we're really excited about that opportunity. So I invite you, we're gonna need youth, uh, kids, youth, and young adults to serve on the teams and some not so young adults like me to go out and lead those teams. So if you've got some interest, if you've got skills, that would be great. If you're like me, if you go without having any skills, uh, they'll find something for us to do. A couple more things. Uh, we're gonna honor our graduates again this year. So we encourage you to come on um, that weekend, but prior to that weekend, to get information in. So if you have a graduate in your immediate family, high school, college, grad school, um, let us know that they're graduating. Um, you'll get an email you should have got maybe already detailing the information. Usually like a picture of where they're graduating from, and then what's next for them. Are they going into the workforce, the military, college, whatever's next for them. We want to celebrate those accomplishments. And then just our regular reminder that Wednesday mornings, we, or Wednesdays, we have a whole bunch of stuff going on. Our prayer group meets at 6.15 in the morning on Zoom, and then Bible study is 6.30 uh, Wednesday evenings. We're working through Adam Hamilton's book, Enough which is also the, the, the core of our sermon series right now. Those are all the announcements I know about, unless more I hear someone else knows other things that we should share. I just want to mention our reading. Um, yes. The fourth, Sunday, the, fourth, fourth Saturday. the fourth Saturday of each month, starting this month, we're going to have a group called Leafing Through the Summer, which is a book club, and it's going to meet Saturday night right after worship. So that Saturday, the fourth Saturday of each month, we're going to meet for worship in the pavilion, and we're just going to stay together. Folks can join us if they don't come to worship that night. We're going to talk through a different book each month. Uh, this month, we're going to read through Denise Cardell's book together. Many of you have read it, but it'll be a chance for us to share what we found in that book, uh, Jeff's story. Uh, we'll announce other books as they come up. But that's going to be the fourth Saturday of each month through the summer, and then we'll see where we go from there. So I encourage you to join us for that uh, if you'd like to do that as well. Let's do what we came to do this morning. Let's focus our hearts and minds. As we gather for worship, as Dr. Steve shares our prayer.
started today, I want you to remember a couple years ago, it was this craze that swept the country. Do you remember Marie Kondo? Her books in her Netflix series, Tidying Up with Marie Kondo, took the country through the world by storm, really. She's a proponent of decluttering our lives, of creating more space in our lives, of keeping only those things that, in her words, spark joy in us. And so part of this process that she took people to on the show, she, she'd go into their houses and she'd have them pick up items. And she'd ask them to hold them in their hand and see if they felt joy from that item. And if they did, they were supposed to keep it. And if they didn't, they were supposed to thank it for being a part of their lives and then let it go, share it with someone else. I gotta tell you, I got a little nervous when Allison started holding my hand and hugging me a little more often. Um, but I'm still here, so I guess there was some joy somewhere in there. But that idea of decluttering, of simplifying, is at the center of this chapter in, in Hamilton's book called Enough. In an effort to find what he calls contentment, which is what we're gonna talk about today, he encourages us to simplify life by reducing our consumption, by taking better care of the things we already have, so they last longer. He suggests a 24-hour waiting period if you're going to make a major purchase. Think about it, go home, think about it some more. And if you still want it the next day, then maybe you should go buy it. But he encourages us also to look at major changes that we can make in our lives that allow us to live more simply, to increase our generosity, to free up time, like Jay talked about last week, that we might increase our service. So I encourage you this week as you hear about some mission opportunities, as you think about things in your life, as we talk about contentment today, I encourage you to look for those ways to simplify, to reduce waste, to reduce distraction, that we find more space to live in, more ways to love, more ways to give, more ways to serve, more ways to grow together. Let's pray this morning. Lord God, we come on this beautiful but kind of chilly morning to give thanks and praise to you for all that you're doing, for all that you've done, for all that's yet to come. Lord, we come to thank you for the mothers of our lives, those who gave birth to us, those who gave us life, those who pointed the way to you on our journey. Lord, help us to live lives that honor them, but most importantly, lives that honor you. So Lord, as we go about our days, we just ask that everything we do we bring honor and glory to your name. And we ask all this in your most precious and holy name. Amen. So Dr. Steve and I are going to share our first hymn, which I conveniently forgot the name of, For the Beauty of the Earth.
children's moment. I actually call it the children and youth moment because I stole this moment to share um, the UM Army mission opportunity. We're going to hear from Darlene Thomas, who is the regional director of UM Army. It's a program that's been around for a long time, and Jane and I never heard of it until about a month ago. Um, they do some amazing work, and it turns out Darlene and I know a whole bunch of people in common, but have never met. So really excited about this opportunity, what it might mean for our kids, our youth, our young adults, and, and those of us adults that are able to go and help too. So this is Darlene Thomas. Darlene Thomas, Regional Director of the Northeast Region of United Methodist Action Reach Out Mission by Youth. Otherwise known as the Army. UM Army is an organization that started 40 plus years ago in the Texas area. It has a small group of people who wanted to volunteer in the local community. It has grown over the past 40 plus years across the United States, including the Northeast about 15 years ago. UM Army is an organization that offers overnight, away from home, youth mission opportunities in various communities across the United States, and specifically here in the Northeast. However, last year, because of the pandemic, we had to reimagine our mission opportunities. And we came up with a virtual mission model that actually went very well and was such a blessing, not only to the people that we serve, but the people who volunteer. So as a result, this summer, we decided to tweak that model to go and serve. Uh, you're going to hear more details about that. An ideal team is two team leaders and then five kids and youth and young adults. So it's from those going in, ending fifth grade this year, all the way up through college can serve on the teams. Some of our college students can serve as team leaders if they're older by a couple of years for safe sanctuaries than the kids serving on the team. And then they do need some not so young adults. Um, to go and help supervise and keep everybody out of trouble, or maybe cause trouble, I don't know, if I go. But um, it's a great opportunity. There is a cost to it. It's $275 for the week. Uh, that covers all the materials and supplies that will be needed. Um, and we have committed to using a, a chunk of the scholarship, the mission scholarship, and some of the ASP money that we have already set aside uh, to kind of get restarted on, on a mission program. What a better thing this summer for our kids, our youth, our young adults to go out and serve uh, folks in tremendous need, really close to home. So I hope you will, as Darlene said, perfectly consider joining that. Uh, talk to me, talk to Pastor Jay, talk to Mary Beth, Matson. Uh, we need to give them a rough sense in the next week or two if we've got at least 18 or if we've got two. Um, that would be wonderful. So just reach out to me, reach out to Jay, reach out to Mary Beth. We appreciate it. As we keep, to, keep as we continue keeping that mission in our prayers. We have so many other things that need your prayers uh, this morning. A couple joys to share. Sometimes we go right to the concerns. And I like to start with joys sometimes. Uh, Jay had an opportunity to visit with Louise Hazeltine recently, and uh, she just wanted to pass along her greetings and just their thankfulness for all of the prayers and, and the cards that she has received. So if y'all have a spare moment, we'd love to send, like to send Louise a card. She would really, really appreciate that. So if you don't have her address, she can get that from the office. And, uh, Maybe we can bless her with some cards. And I think the uh, extended Bessler family has some good news. Aren't they want to share? You want me to share? We've got a new baby. A new baby. And 
absolutely. Emma Ray. Emma Ray Bessler, daughter of Colleen and Kayla, uh, was born on Thursday? Wednesday? Yeah. Cinco de Mayo, all right. So we went from Star Wars Day to Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. Uh, lots of reasons to celebrate. Everybody's healthy at home, and we are so thankful to have a new baby in our midst, in our church family. So we celebrate with all of you guys. But like life happens in the midst of those celebrations, we do have concerns and worries that we share. Uh, we ask you to continue to pray for the friends and family of Carl Good. Carl lost his life in that tragic fire. Uh, all of us who knew him, uh, keep everyone in your prayers, if you would. Uh, we'd ask you to keep Kurt Bennett, who's Aaron Martin's dad, in your prayers. He's recuperating from, recuperating from some additional surgery this week and could really use your prayers. Uh, many of you saw the prayer request for Keith Campbell. I will tell you without getting into too much detail, the prayer request sounded, it was a whole lot worse than what the prayer request sounded like. It was pretty scary for a little while. He had to go to the ER and ambulance and get what was fixed, fixed again and stop some bleeding. So. Keep Keith and Amy and the kids in your prayers, if you would. Um, one that was the opposite is another praise. Uh, Skip Gross had a run-in with a log splitter. You all saw that email. Um, it sounded a lot worse than it maybe has turned out to be. Uh, he, he's healing, and, and things look like he's going to be, be okay. So we are thankful. Keep Skip and Lois in your prayers. Uh, keep Kelly Magdalinski, who is one of our tech at aides, in your prayers. She has some surgery and is home recuperating. Uh, and then all those who are grieving a loss of loved ones, especially this day. Ongoing concerns. Madeline and Jim are headed down to Fox Chase for another follow-up. So always a, a worrisome time. So just keep Madeline and Jim in your prayers. Barry and Heidi, we continue to pray with you guys. We know you're following up with a specialist. Uh, and we have a list of other folks who just need your prayers today. Uh, Frank and Melanie Wahalik, Carrie McCall, uh, Jay's brother Gerald and his wife Colleen, Bob Johnson, Jeff and Charlotte Farley, Dave and Melissa Conrad, and then Julie. That's all I got is Julie. But God knows what Julie means, so we're going to pray. And then last night, uh, Roxanne has joined us the last few weeks, asked us to pray for her brother Frank. Uh, he's having some surgery this week on Friday. So uh, keep Frank in your prayers as well. I know you all have more. And we'll have a moment of quiet during our prayer time where you can lift those up with your voice if you're comfortable, in the quiet if you'd rather do it that way. But as we start, I want to share a reflection uh, as we start this journey of prayer together, that Jay put together and shared out an email and out on our Facebook page, and it's about mothers. So join me in prayer and an attitude of prayer as we reflect today. To those who gave birth this year, we celebrate with you. To those who are grieving a child, we grieve with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed adoptions, or runaways, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. To those who are foster moms and mentor moms and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have warm and close relationships with your children, we rejoice with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with your children, we sit with you. To those who have lost their mothers, we weep with you. To those who experienced abuse at the hands of their own mother, we acknowledge your experience. To those who lived through driving tests and medical tests and the overall test of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. For those who long to mother their own children, we yearn with you. To those who step parent, we walk with you on these complex paths. To those who envision lavishing love on grandchildren, but have not had that opportunity, we endure with you. 
to those who will have emptier nests in the upcoming year. We both grieve and rejoice with you. And to those who are pregnant with new life, whether expected or surprising, we anticipate with you. Lord God, bless all who mother us. Bless them and heal us to perfect relationships with you and with one another. And Lord, in some way as we honor and remember today, help us to live lives that honor and love. Help us to share the good news. Help us to point people to you the way the mothers, whether they were the ones who gave us birth and life, or they were the ones who guided us along our path and pointed the way to you. Help us to live lives like that, lives that point others to you, giving all we have and all we are and all we're ever going to be to the love and care of others. So Lord, this morning we do give you thanks for the mothers of our lives, for the impacts that they've had. And Lord, we offer grace and forgiveness for all the things that they couldn't be. Lord, help us to honor and remember. And whether today is a happy day of celebration or a tough day, help us find the joy in all circumstances as we look back, as we remember, as we give thanks. And Lord, help us to live as people full of that joy People who go out into the world to make a difference. Whether it's as close as our own nursery school and our church grounds, or it's as far away as a place like Mexico or other mission trips. Lord, help us to see what you have us do. Equip us for the work. But then give us the courage to take that first step. Even if we can't see the rest of the staircase, help us to know that you go with us. That there's nowhere we can go that we're out of your presence. Remind us of your promise of a future filled with hope if we but seek you with our whole hearts. So Lord, this morning, help us to do that. Help us to seek you with everything we've got. Help us to turn ourselves over to you that you might work on us and in us and through us to change this world. But Lord, that change starts in us. So today, make us disciples in the truest sense of the word. Those who learn from you, who follow you. Most importantly, those who go and do for you and for others. Make us those kind of disciples, we pray. Make us disciples bold enough to pray along with your very first disciples. The prayer you taught them. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Just a quick word of gratitude, again, for all the generosity, all the work that went into the barbecue, all the work that happens here, all of the giving that has been happening this year through this pandemic, through incredibly tough times, you all have kept us moving, kept us meeting our obligations and going beyond our obligations to love and serve in Jesus' name out in the community and around the world. And we are thankful for that generosity and that giving. In addition to the UM Army, you're hearing a lot about mission today. Um, you're going to hear about our mission of the month, which is Give Ye Them to Eat, the mission in rural Mexico. That is such a huge part of Rev's life. Mary Hartman, one of our former pastors, our former district superintendent. Uh, I was blessed to go with her a couple years ago. As Holly was. Holly did twice uh, down in Mexico to, to serve among these folks and serve with them and work with them. We wanted you to hear directly from Rev this morning about this project. Give you come to me, or as we call it, Jay, is the mission project or truck spill for the month of May. I've been taking part in that ministry for the last 21 years. I was touched by the holistic nature of the ministry. 
as it encompasses livestock, agriculture, community development, church and spiritual development, health care, health um, prevention, all of these things that help improve the lives of those living in the rural areas of Mexico, which are greatly underserved by government agencies. Using appropriate technology, methods both ancient and modern, the staff at the Jitty Training Center share freely with others construction methods such as straw bale construction, the use of dry composting toilets where water is scarce, how to disinfect fruits and vegetables, how to dehydrate and make dried fruits and vegetables so that you have them throughout the year. There are many things that are taught to help people not only improve their standard of living, but to improve their self-esteem and their relationships with each other and with God. During this time of COVID, contributions to Jitty have fallen. There's a saying in Mexico that when the U.S. gets a cold, Mexico gets pneumonia. And so I ask you to prayerfully consider what you can do to help support this vital ministry. Thank you, and God bless. Dios te bendiga. Last week we talked about the health promoters and the way we can raise funds to educate women in these rural villages where they don't have doctors to go back to their communities and make a difference. Um, she mentioned sustainable agriculture. For thirty dollars, we can sponsor a local farmer to come for a day to the ranch at Jitty and learn those sustainable agriculture techniques that they teach. Thirty bucks. What a difference we could make. So, as you consider, as she said, prayerfully consider what you can give. Uh, support them with your prayers. Consider what you can give. One of my long-term dreams and goals is we get a team of eight or ten or twelve of us from here that are able to go and serve and have that experience. It is truly a life-changing place. They call it the Tree of Life. It changed my life. So as you can, consider what you can give, keep them in your prayers, and let's keep working towards putting a team together someday. I think we have some special music from the Bessemer family this morning.
you all. Of course, that was the best for N Banks family. I, I neglected to say that. We're thankful that you guys did that. It was a wonderful gift to all of us this morning. And our scripture this morning is Cole Johnston sharing 1 Timothy. Today's scriptural lesson is a reading from the first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10, from the New Revised Standard Version. Of course, there is a great gain in godliness to mind of contentment. For we brought nothing into this world, so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. For those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many things. The word of God is the people of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts and minds be deemed worthy and acceptable in your sight. We pray, O Lord. Amen. This isn't in what I wrote, but there, there's an irony to this passage for me. Um, every time it comes up, I end up preaching on it. And if you all know what I do the rest of my life, I manage investments for people. And then you hear, money's the root of all evil in that passage you just read. It's not really what it says, right? It says, the love of money is the root of all evil. So, I just want to get that out there. Um, but God does have a pretty wicked sense of humor sometimes. Um, and I appreciate it. But anyway, for those of you who have kids, or have raised kids, or have taught kids, or shoot, if you spend any amount of time with kids, I got a question. Was there ever a time you tried to teach your kids something and it backfired on me? When you thought, this will be just the thing to show them how lucky they are, how good they've got it. Or you wanted them to learn something, and it just went completely the other way. I found this anecdote from Dan and Asmussen, and it shares that idea, and it sums up really what we're going to talk about today. So one day, this very wealthy father took his son on a trip to the country, he dropped him off with this rural, very poor farming family. The idea was to give this kid a sense of what it was really like to be poor. So the kid spent a few days on the farm, and his dad came back and picked him up, and on their way home, the father asked the son, how did you like the trip? The boy said, oh, it was great, Dad. The father said, did you, did you see how poor people can be? The kid said, yeah, yeah, I really did. Well, so what did you learn? His father asked him. The son answered, well, I saw that we have one dog, and they have four. We have a pool in the middle of our yard, but they have a creek that goes on forever. We've got these imported lanterns in our yard, but they have the stars and fireflies at night. We've got a nice patio in our front yard, but Dad, they've got the whole horizon to look at. We've got this tiny little piece of land to live on. They have fields that go on for days. Dad, we have servants that serve us, but they serve each other. We buy our food, and they grow theirs. We've got walls and gates around our house to protect us, but they have friends that do that for them. The father was quiet for a while. He didn't know what to say. And the kid said, thanks for sending me on this trip, Dad. I realized really how poor we are. Sometimes perspective matters. Understanding matters. That's why mission trips are so important. You see different circumstances. You learn about yourself. You learn about other cultures, other places. But that perspective is this idea of enough that we've been talking about as we work through this book in Bible study and in worship and as we continue on, let's go back over the ground we've already covered. Right, we've talked about this constant pursuit in today's world of more. About the illness of affluenza and credititis. The idea that the world tells us we need more and better all the time. And if we can't pay for it now, we'll just pay for it later. About the desire to keep up with the Joneses. Last week, Pastor Jay talked about giving generously to God being intentional with our time, about loving those that we need on our journey, about living on purpose. And today, we're going to talk about the idea of contentment. Contentment, or, or being content with something, is defined as 
feeling or showing satisfaction with one's possessions or status or situation. In Bible study this past week, Pastor Jay shared that the word that we use as content or contentment actually comes from a Greek word, which means not being bothered by external circumstances. That's a pretty good definition of contentment. And yet, while that's what we're talking about, in the book, Hamilton introduces another concept, another diagnosis, really, and says that many of us, in addition to affluenza and credititis, suffer from what he calls restless heart syndrome. The idea that we're never truly satisfied. That the moment we bought or acquired or obtained or achieved something, we almost immediately start to look for the next thing. That we're never, never truly satisfied. And so for me, in a real way, before we can talk about contentment, we're going to talk about this idea of discontent first, of dissatisfaction. Because sometimes we only really understand or appreciate something by looking at its opposite or its absence, right? You really don't know what light means until you've been in a very dark room, or you don't know what dark means until you've been somewhere, maybe in the western part of this state in the middle of the night where there's no light pollution. That's dark. And when the sun comes up, boy, is it bright. Clean really only exists as a, um, a lack of dirty, right? You gotta know what a dirty room looks like and what a clean room looks like. We have a bunch of those at my house. The first one, not the second one. Um, so let's talk about it. Let's talk about discontent. And right out of the gate, let's be clear about something. Discontent isn't always a bad thing. It can be motivational and inspirational. It can spur us to action to change our circumstances or, or to reach out and help somebody else change theirs. And in many ways, I think we're meant to exist with a certain level of discontent in our lives. In this book, Hamilton shares a quote from James Mackintosh, who was a Scottish philosopher and a politician in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. I want you to hear what he says. He says, it is right to be content with what we have, but never with what we are. It is right to be content with what we have, but never with what we are. Now, I don't know about you, but too many times I've gotten that backwards in my life. There have been many times where I've taken that, eh, it's good enough approach with who I am, but never with what I want. I always want the better and the best and the next. I get it backwards. Maybe you do too. But what if? What if we were able to live that the right, the right way around? to find contentment in what we have and live discontented with who we are. And maybe even more importantly, discontented with the way the world is. It's hard. I'm trying, here's an example, right? Up till now, I've been, uh, maybe if not content, then at least ambivalent about my health. I go to the doctor, he says, you're okay. I take that as gospel truth that I just go back to eating and junk food and doing what I do. I finally got into the place where I realized I need to work on some things. And I'm using that discontent, the good kind, and letting it be what drags me out of bed almost every morning for three or four miles on a treadmill. It's a process. It took me 48, almost 49 years to mess this up. I'm not going to fix it in two months. But it's a process, and I'm working on it. Or here's another example. Instead of focusing on that next thing that I want, right, last week, Pastor Jay shared about wanting a bigger TV because he's under this delusion that the Las Vegas Raiders are going to make the Super Bowl. I want a bigger TV because I'm under a delusion that the Phillies are going to be in the World Series. Um, same thing. I want this TV. Do I need it? No, Allison tells me all the time. The one you've got speaking up, and it is, but I want a bigger one. But what if I focus my energies on that discontent around not a bigger TV, but about the inequities in the world? on the discontent and the discomfort of those who feel like they're on the outside are excluded from fellowship and from our circle? How can I spend those resources to make a difference in somebody else's life and address those challenges? I got a TV. There's a lot of people that feel left out that need to be brought in. Maybe that's a better use of my time and resources. That kind of discontent is powerful, and it can bring amazing change in our lives and to the world. But this restless heart syndrome that Hamilton talks about, that's a slippery slope. It's a dangerous path with all kinds of trouble waiting for us. 
at the bottom. You don't know what the answer is, or you wouldn't be here this morning, right? So let's do that first. Let's do the answer, and then we'll backtrack and talk about how we mess it up. The answer is to find our complete contentment, to find our identity and our value in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's it. That's what it's all about. St. Augustine put it this way. It's kind of a 4th century version of Hamilton's Restless Heart Syndrome. He said, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in thee. Far be it for me to rephrase one of the greatest theologians and thinkers in church history, but I struggle sometimes with all the vows and the thees and the thys and some of those quotes. So here's, here's the Ian paraphrase of what he said, and you've heard some of this before from me. We've all got a God-shaped hole in our hearts. And we spend a lot of time and money and energy trying to fill that thing up. We stuck in job titles and 401k balances and paychecks and cars and relationships and houses and alcohol and drugs and sex and whatever else you want to stuff in that hole, we stuff it in there to try and make ourselves feel better. And you know what the kick in the butt is? It works. It works for a while. It fills that gap for a while. But before too long, those things stop being enough. And the emptiness creeps back in. And we're faced with a choice. We can try and numb the pain and discomfort with more stuff and more people and more of whatever it was that worked last time. Friends, that's a textbook definition of addiction, right? To get to the same high I got to before, I gotta get more of what I had the last time to get there. But it's a slippery slope. But it's an option. We can keep trying that. Or we can surrender. Not surrender in terms of losing and giving up, but surrender in terms of acceptance. Acceptance that what I've done up until this point hadn't worked very well, hadn't been right, has been wrong. We can surrender in the sense of turning ourselves fully over to God. Not mostly, not partly, fully. We can surrender in the sense of leaving behind the things we've leaned on to lean only on God. Surrender in the sense of looking nowhere else but our relationship with God for ultimate fulfillment, fulfillment and our truest sense of identity and purpose. To allow the only one who can fill that God-shaped hole to fill it permanently. God and God alone. So as we talk about contentment, that's what allows Paul to write what he writes in Philippians chapter 4. Listen to verses 11 to 13. Not that I'm referring to be in need, Paul says, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I want you to hear it differently. I want you to hear from the message. Same couple of verses. I'm glad in God, far happier than you would ever guess. Actually, I don't have a sense of needing anything personally. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Now, Paul wrote those words not from a comfortable chair at a nice desk in a dry, safe room. He wrote those words from the bottom of a dank, dark prison cell. So let's dig into a bit of what he said there, because there's hope in it for you and for me. Because at least for me, too many times I have these stained glass images and ideas of saints and biblical figures. Like, they got it all figured out. Like, that's who I want to be. And I forget that they were real, live, living, breathing, messed up people who struggled a lot. Listen to what Paul said. He said, I've learned. Right? He wasn't born this way. He didn't just show up one day, have it all figured out. He had to learn 
didn't come natural. He had to work on it. He said, I've learned by now. Means it didn't happen right away. Sounds like it took Paul some time to get where he is. He said, I've learned by now to be quite content. He didn't say I'm fully content, right? Paul's still got some stuff going on. He's still struggling. But what I love most is that last line. Paul says, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Sit with that one for a minute. The one who makes me who I am. It's none of that stuff I've been trying to put in that God-shaped hole that makes me who I am. It's God and God alone. It gets me through. And I've shared before how important that word through has become to me the last year or two. In, in a place like uh, the 23rd Psalm, right? You all know it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say, yea, though I wallow here in this valley and feel bad for myself till I die. Does it? No. It says, yea, though I walk through the valley. Paul doesn't write, I can wallow in misery in the one who makes me who I am. He says, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. Because you see, when we find our identity, our value, our purpose in a relationship with God through Jesus, we'll learn by now to be quite content. Maybe not all at once. Definitely not because we're that good and that strong and that smart. But only in and through the power and grace of the one who makes us who we are. Towards the end of the chapter, Hamilton asks us to consider what kind of tent we're going to live in. He says, you've got a choice. You can live in contentment or discontentment. And it's a choice. It's our choice, yours and mine. We get to choose the tent that we live in. We can keep living in the same old ratty, nasty one we've been building and living in, crammed full of stuff and titles and resources. Or we can let him knock it all down and start over and build a new one. One where the Lord guides and directs. Where we find our identity in Christ, not in worldly stuff. And where we find joy in simplicity, in generosity, and in service. Knowing, believing, and trusting that God provides. Because God provides. Because God promised. Because God's faithful. My friends, this morning, how's your tent? Let's pray. Lord, help us to lean into you and away from all those things that cause us momentary happiness, but cost us joy. Help us to lean into you more fully than we ever have before. Knowing, trusting, believing in the promises you've made, and knowing that you are always faithful to those promises. Lord, help us to live lives like that, we pray. Lives that are full and content. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Dr. Steve and I are going to share our closing hymn. It's God of the Sparrow, God of the Lamb. It talks about God's provision and God's care.
find your home in him, and then go share that with somebody else. Go live that life of service and love. And as you do it, go knowing that the creator of the universe loves you more than you'll ever know or understand. And there's not a darn thing you can do about it, except go tell somebody else. So go love and serve in his name today and every day. And all God's people said, Amen. I ask you to stay where you are during Dr. Steve's post loot as Barry brings around the whites and we care for our space here. Thanks for being here this morning. Mm -hmm.